Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last left Claiborne, he was traveling out of Kentucky and back into Tennessee. What awaited him in the next few months only raised his star higher in the minds of the Confederacy. After making it to Chattanooga, Claiborne and the rest of the army moved into Middle Tennessee. During this time, Braxton Bragg reorganized the Army of the Mississippi and got it renamed the Army of Tennessee. Furthermore, Hardy's Corps got reorganized. Claiborne's division commander, Simon Bolivar Buckner, was assigned to command the garrison at Mobile, leaving a vacancy in the division. The other two brigade commanders were Sterling Wood and Bushrod Johnson. Wood had no military experience previous to the war, but Johnson had graduated from West Point, served against the Seminoles, and in the Mexican-American War. Formally trained and an able commander, Johnson seemed to be the natural choice. However, the decision would be left up to the Confederate government and specifically President Jefferson Davis. Both Hardy and Bragg wrote letters of recommendation to the president for Claiborne to be given the rank of Major General and the commander of that division. Bragg wrote that he was young, ardent, exceedingly gallant, but sufficiently prudent and the admiration of his command. With that, Claiborne became a Major General and a division commander in December of 1862. His brigade would be commanded by Lucius Polk. The new Major General would take on new responsibilities. His staff grew to include an Assistant Adjutant General, a Chief of Artillery, a Chief of Subsistence, and a Quartermaster. The head of his staff being Major Calhoun Benham, who had served under Albert Sidney Johnston and PGT Beauregard. All in all, his staff included 12 members. Not being a person well acquainted with all the roles that the staff performed, he mostly allowed his staff to operate with very little, if any, direct supervision. This also endeared him to his staff. Claiborne disdained the symbols of rank. He felt much more comfortable with the simple things rather than the elaborate and ornate. His staff hired a French cook at $40 a month to cook meals for them. Claiborne, being a more humble person and preferring more simpler tastes, ate the majority of his meals with the division medical officer, Dr. John M. Johnson. Another peculiarity with Claiborne was that he or his staff had a pet raccoon. At night, it would crawl under the covers of a member of the staff. Sometimes that officer might not want to have the company and kicks the animal out of the bed. The little raccoon would just find another bed to climb into. One night, the poor animal couldn't find a bed and began crying. One of the staff officers found it and brought it into his tent. Not only did Claiborne receive his appointment as Major General in December, but Davis visited the Army of Tennessee at Murfreesboro. Claiborne would not get to meet the Commander-in-Chief because he was 20 miles away leading a column of troops against a federal force near Franklin, Tennessee. He probably wouldn't have liked all the celebration anyway. He was uncomfortable in those situations. For example, he did not attend famed Cavalier John Hunt Morgan's wedding or the large Christmas Eve ball held in Murfreesboro. He was content with sitting at his headquarters. As one of his biographers stated, he would rather lead a desperate charge against the enemy than engage in polite social conversation with ladies whom he did not know well. Also that winter, his youngest half-brother, Christopher, traveled through the lines from Cincinnati to Claiborne's headquarters to visit his brother. The young man, just 21 years old, would join Morgan's band of cavaliers and throw his lot in for the South. As the end of December approached, Bragg's assumption that Union General William S. Rosecrans would not move out of Nashville was dashed. The Union Army was on the move against the Confederates around Murfreesboro, so Bragg had to recall his troops to concentrate against the enemy. Claiborne's men marched some 20 miles to rejoin the army. Then on December 30th, as it became dusky dark, his division took off their shoes, socks, and trousers in order to wade through the Cold Stones River. Once across, the 6,000 men were placed in their assigned locations by Claiborne and his staff. During the night, Claiborne met with the brigade commanders of McCown's division, who Patrick was supposed to support in their large swing against the Union right flank. It was well after midnight when Claiborne's men bedded down on the wet ground to get a little sleep before the dawn attack on December 31st. At dawn, McCown's division moved out with Claiborne's division right behind. They encountered the Union right flank, but once it was turned, McCown, instead of heading to the right, kept traveling to the left or further west. This opened up a large gap in the Confederate line. Claiborne filled it with his division, and as they kept pushing against the blue lines, other gaps emerged. Claiborne filled that gap with his divisional reserves. Near the Wilkinson Pike, he encountered some heavy resistance from Union artillery. He sent out his sharpshooters against those cannon crews, but they couldn't make any headway. 
so Claiborne called off the sharpshooters and ordered his artillery, who were able to silence a few of the guns, which allowed his infantry to move in. Part of the division attacked the back side of the slaughter pen and then moved north. Claiborne worked tirelessly to organize his division, which was spreading out on the east side of the battlefield. He chased the blue troops all the way to the Nashville Pike, but the Union line held when Claiborne advanced against it. All his troops could do was pull back to the tree line, but his advanced position without artillery made his position untenable. Claiborne's men slept on the ground without blankets, as most of them had discarded their packs to allow for more maneuverability and prevent being drugged down by the weight during the attack. When light appeared on the first day of 1863, Claiborne looked across the field between his troops and the Union soldiers positioned on the Nashville Pike. The field was strewn with rifles. Claiborne rode out into the field with sharpshooters taking careful aim at him and collected many weapons. His staff ventured with him, but at a much more timid pace. One of his staff members wrote that it reminded him of the goat that tried to knock a train engine off the track. He said, I admired his spunk, but had very poor opinion of his judgment. For the rest of the day, Claiborne monitored the situation in his front until Bragg ordered him to move forward for a reconnaissance mission to find out if the Union Army was still there in strength. Claiborne sent in two brigades, but found the Union Army well entrenched and ready to fight. He reported as much to Bragg. For another night, the men slept on the ground without fires to keep them warm in the harsh winter weather. On January 2nd, Breckenridge's division launched their assault on the Union left, but it failed and Bragg ordered his forces to fall back. Just like at Perryville, Claiborne's men had relinquished the ground they had fought so hard to capture. It broke Patrick's heart to know that his soldiers, who had gave their blood and sweat to gain that ground, had to abandon it to the enemy. Bragg met with his commanders and Bragg spoke openly about retreat. Polk and Hardy agreed and the meeting ended. They sent the supply wagons to the southeast toward Tullahoma. Then Bragg thought better of it and called his commanders to him to discuss the situation again for the second time that day. He asked his corps and division commanders if the march could be postponed 24 hours because if not, around 1,700 badly wounded soldiers unable to walk would be left behind. Claiborne spoke up and said that they could hold off an attack if it was made. Both Polk and Hardy explained that with the ammunition wagons already sent away, the army could not effectively fight an engagement. Claiborne changed his mind and it was decided to not delay the retreat. Claiborne's men and much of his army did a forced march to Tullahoma, but although relatively safe from the Union Army, another threat came to the weary Confederates. Criticism of the retreat and Bragg circulated around the Confederacy and through the army. Bragg sent letters to his corps and division commanders and asked them two questions. One was whether Bragg resisted the retreat and that his commanders provided a consensus to retreat. This would help him in his standing in political circles and with the public. Two, had he lost favor and confidence with his subordinates? He asked the men to be candid. Hardy came to Claiborne and they discussed how to proceed, and Hardy suggested that they truly be candid because this might oust Bragg from command of the army. Each division and corps commander wrote their letters. Claiborne stated that a retreat had been agreed upon and that the only resistance Bragg put forward was to postpone the retreat and nothing else. To the second question, Claiborne answered in the affirmative that Bragg had lost the confidence of his commanders and troops. All the commanders said pretty much the same thing, except for Cheatham, who said that he was one of the first to suggest a retreat, but ignored the question of whether Bragg had lost confidence with the army. This irritated and enraged many of the commanders because Cheatham was more than willing to criticize Bragg behind his back but when given the opportunity to criticize the man to his face, he chose not to. Claiborne would make fun of Cheatham and tease him by telling him a story. It goes as follows. The report had been circulated among the beasts of the forest that the lion had a bad breath, whereupon as king the lion summoned all to appear and admitted to them to his presence one by one. As each would answer upon smelling his breath that it was bad, the lion would devour him. When at length the fox was brought in, he replied to the question that he had a bad cold and escaped. The consultation with his commanders only convinced Bragg that he was a victim of a cabal. Ultimately, he had the confidence of Jefferson Davis, who supported Bragg more fully as politicians and commanders pushed for the army commander's removal. Claiborne, at the behest of the army commander when he asked for candid responses, had involved himself in army politics, and those conflicts would continue in the months to come.